Thank you to the Moshevat family for allowing us to continue to remember Yaakov through the Torah of this Moshevat. It was 22 years ago that up in the director's trailer that I was first told that Yaakov, while he was looking for a Machanechut site for his Chanichim, that he had been in a tragic car accident and, been, and had been killed. And it was at this Moshevam where we came back on the last day of Shiva, which happened to be Tisha B'Av. Today is the second of Av. Tisha B'Av was the last day of the Shiva, and we came directly back to Moshevam. And so this place has a lot of wonderful memories and a lot of very strong memories. There are very few people who are Mosheva this summer who knew Yaakov. 22 years is a long time. He was a Rosh Avodam. He was a Madrich. He had made the choice to continue to study in Chicago after his years in Yeshivat Haritzion in order to be involved in B'nai Akiva and to take care of what needed to be taken care of. And today, I wanted to talk with you about is that idea of staying doing what needs to be taken care of, specifically the issue of Tzorchei Tzibur, get involved in things that are bigger than ourselves, getting involved in things that are about others, maybe even more than it is about ourselves. And it starts from the very first Makor, the very first page, which is a famous Nam Pirkei Avot, Shimon HaTzadik Hayami Shiaret, Knesset Dolam, Shimon HaTzadik began a new era. He was the last of the Anshe Knesset Dolam, who Omer al Shlod Verma Olam made three pillars to this world Ala Toravi, Ala Avodavi, Al Gmilut Chasadim, and Toram, and Avodah, which is service of Hashem. It's the Avodah that we do every day in the Avodah Shebelev of Tfilah, of Davening. And on Gmilut Chasadim, three things hold up the world. Rav Aaron Lichtenstein Zatzal, in one of his sichot that was delivered at Yeshivat Haaretzion, and that has been republished in a book called By His Light, which was also dedicated to Yaakov's memory, Rav Lichtenstein notes that when we talk about the Shloshad Dvarim HaOlam made, that there are three pillars for this world, it doesn't say which is first and which is second and which is third. And so if you look on line 10 on the first page, the common denominator of these three pillars of human existence is the fact that they're not clearly defined. There are no sharply limited parameters. In other words, it doesn't say how much Torah, keeps the world going, and how much Gemilut Chasadim, and how much Avodah, just the three of them, but nowhere do we have any clear definition as to, how, as to how an individual's spiritual existence is to be divided among these three, and he gives examples of how each one can be in the briefest of fashions. And so, for example, when it comes to Torah study, learning Torah, one of those three, the learning of Torah, is something that can be accomplished just by saying Shema in the morning, in the evening, or perhaps even less. Or for example, Tfilah, when it comes to davening, we have a big sitter, but Midyaraita from the Torah, really all Tfilah is about is saying, help me God. You said that, Moshe Rabbeinu said it in five words. Kelna, Rifanala when he was praying for Miriam, and he fulfilled that pillar of tefillah. And then, of course, Gmilut Chasadim. We don't know how much Gmilut Chasadim is involved, which Rev Lichtenstein continues, and it's on line 31 in the handout. This, open up, this opens up the possibility, on the one hand, of trying somehow to touch all bases, or on the other hand, of dedicating and devoting oneself to one area as the matrix and focus of one's avodat Hashem. Because we don't know how much, maybe you should just do one as best as you can. 
or maybe you should try to do all three. Ultimately, we're, we, as he says in the last couple of lines, we are then confronted by the question of priorities and objectives, of how we're going to be able to divide our time. The important thing to realize is that all three are critical. It doesn't say one over the other. Which brings us to a fascinating question on the second page. Also, a famous article that Rav Lichtenstein wrote more than 40 years ago about Yeshivot has there, and today is even more in the news and in our minds. Because there's a great debate going on in Israel right now. There's a debate among the Haredi community versus the Datit Zioni community. What should be the responsibility of those who are learning in yeshivot? Should they also have to serve in the army, especially at the time of war? The Haredi community says that their learning of Torah keeps the Jewish people alive, and there are sources to say so. The Dati Leumi community, that which we associate with, especially here in Moshevam, our community says no, that to serve in the army is part of who we are, not just because we want to help, but it's part of the definition of what it means to be an Eved Hashem, to be a servant of Hashem. And so you have, on the one hand, as Rev Lichtenstein writes in line four, during the formative post-secondary years, a Ben Torah should be firmly rooted in, the pre in a preeminently Torah climate. We accept, we believe, that as soon as possible, people should be learning Torah at the greatest depth, the greatest intensity possible. But we also believe, as he writes on line eight, second, the defense of Israel is an ethical and halachic imperative. But we also have to defend the state of Israel. The question, however, as he writes in line 17, the halachic rationale for Hezder does not, as some mistakenly assume, rest solely upon the, the mitzvah of waging defensive war. But the reason our community serves in the army, takes time away from learning Torah, is because, not because there's a war and we have to defend ourselves, that's one reason, but it's not all, that's not what it's all about. Rather, as he writes, line 22, serving in the army is an element of gmilut chasadim. It's about the concern for others. We have to be involved. Al shloshad varim ha'olam omed, al toravi, al avodavi, al gmilut chasadim. In other words, two pillars are fulfilled by being in the in the yeshivot as there. You fulfill the Torah during the years you're learning Torah, and you also fulfill the gemilut chasadim during the time you're serving in the army. This argument, this idea of trying to figure out what's most important, plays a role in Israel today. And while Rav Lichtenstein ends on line 32, much as I would like the great majority of their students to modify their course out of a person out of personal conviction, it says while he would like to have in the Haredi community those who are studying Torah to also serve in the army, I have no desire to legislate them out of existence or into Yeshivot Tzedir. He steps back and he says that's a choice they need to make, and I won't make for them. Part of the greatness of Rav Lichtenstein was understanding the different worlds. Our world understands those two pillars. The Avodah is the pillar of Tefillah. We'll get to in a moment. But how does it play itself out? And so if you look in Tanakh, you find fascinating pieces about it. The very first piece is you find Abraham Avinu in a number of places. If you remember right before Right before Stom and Amora were destroyed, Hakadosh Baruch Hu says, "Vashem Amar, Hamechasani me Avraham, Asher Asher Ani Osem, Can I hide from Avram that which I'm about to do?" 
And it's then that he tells him that he's going to destroy Sdom and Amora. And it's then that Abraham Avinu gets into the famous bargain of maybe there are 50 tzaddiki, maybe there's 45, maybe you can find enough reason to be able to save that community. Writes the Khatam Sofer. He says, line 38, he says, if Abraham says, if Abraham had been of the level of a prophet to be able to know about these things himself, God wouldn't have held it back. God wouldn't have had to tell him and say, I can't keep him out of the picture. I'm a Hassani. I can't keep him in the dark. He would have let him know just like he let Yeshayahu, Yirmiyahu, Yecheskel, other prophets. But the Chatham was not as great of a Navi as Yeshayahu, Yirmiyahu, Yecheskel. He didn't make it there. Why? Line 42. It wasn't that he wasn't, it, he didn't have the potential to be a great Davi, but because he couldn't focus on doing it. And the reason why Abraham Avinu did not achieve the greatness of prophecy was because he was too busy teaching his children and teaching those who were in his household to be able to understand, to know Hashem. In other words, what the Khatam Sofer says is this amazing thought. Avram Avinu was not as great as he could have been from a spiritual perspective because he took his way to help others. He involved he wasn't as great of a Navi as the Noam Elimelech of the Shepherd on page three. Same. Negotiations, the Psukim are. Avram says first 50, but maybe there's only 45. Are you going to destroy the city over just five less? God says, I won't destroy it at 45. And you know the debate went back and forth with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. He's trying to make them understand. On that piece, on line 23, in the middle of the line, Rabbi Elimelech of Lezhensk explains, Yesh l'dakdek b'lashon ula yachsum. We have to be careful. We have to try to understand very carefully what does it mean? Maybe there's going to be missing. Ki elo lomar ula yim tzuun arbaim v'chamisha. Kamo sheishi v'hashem yitbarach. Why didn't he say, maybe you'll find 45? Why didn't he say, what would be if you're missing just five? That a tzaddik offers to the Jewish people three things. Family, the, the life, and also sustenance. But in order for a tzaddik to have an impact on the world, he has to go down a bit. He has to stop thinking about himself and how close he can be to God. And he has to be closer to the people he's around. That ultimately, if you want to have an impact on this world, you have to engage in this world. 
So Avram Avinu started this negotiation and the language of the negotiation was one where Avram Avinu Yachsirun, maybe we'll be short five, maybe we're going to go down, there's going to be a chisaron, there's going to be a lacking, because it was symbolic that Avram Avinu himself, to have this debate with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, had lowered himself from his ultimate personal protect, personal potential. And on, on page four, the Nitziv. Remember who the Nitziv was. The Nitziv was the great Rosh Yeshiva He died in 1893, a broken man after the Yeshiva had been closed. But the Nitziv was also one of the great proponents of early religious Zionism, of Chovavei Tzion. He didn't allow it in the yeshiva because he told the boys in the yeshiva they have to be focused on their learning. Just like Rav Lichtenstein talked about as well, they have to have that depth initially. But he himself was involved in the movement. Look, and he said, look at Moshe Rabbeinu. And when you look at what Moshe Rabbeinu did, he says, and this appears in Tvarib, there are four classes within the Jewish people. From the words Matov. One is Roshimu Manikim Yisrael. The first is the leadership of the Jewish people. The second, Zigne Israel. The second are the religious leadership. The third, Balabati Moskim Beparnasatam are the people who are be earning a living, the Balabatim. Then you have the fourth, Nashim, Vavadim, Uptanim, the families, the women, the children, those servants. And everyone has a different role that HaKadosh Baruch Hu asks of them. What is the difference? Ultimately, he brings back, us back to Avraham Avinu in Parashat Vayera. That Parashat Vayera with Avraham Avinu is amazing. He says, and this is on line 16, V'amru b'Shabbat perek mefanim, gadolach nasat orchim yoter me'akbalat p'nei ha'shchina. You all know this. That when Avraham Avinu, he was talking to God, and he stops talking to God, and he goes to greet somebody. He greets the strangers. Says the Gemara about this, this teaches us that greeting visitors is greater than greeting God. Explains the the Nitziv at the end of line seventeen. Ela shizah mitzvah gedolamizo. He says ultimately one is greater than the other. V'hinidchid mi menam k'moshasav ram avinu b'shash amad lifnei Hashem. And one gets pushed off from the other. You have a choice of standing before God, talking to God, or helping someone else. Help someone else. Line 21. And if you think is so great, working with the entire community, solving the needs of a community, is even greater. A person who's involved with the community actually would be exempted from davening. Because, oh, sake of mitzvah, patur mina mitzvah. If you're involved in one mitzvah, you're exempted from another mitzvah. If you were so involved, and ultimately, as he writes on line 23, he says, ultimately, Sorchet Sibur being involved with others is even more important than drawing close to Akkadish Borg. We have the examples of Avraham Avinu, three of them that were offered. The first is when he, we find out he wasn't as great of a Navi as he could have been because he was involved in his family. The second, because he wanted to be able to negotiate with HaKadosh Baruch Hu Yachsirun, he went down a level to be able to do so. The third, he was talking to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and he walked away from him to take care of Achnasat Orchim. With Moshe Rabbeinu, we see also that his leadership was even more important. The Tzorchei Tzibor was even more important than drawing close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And says the Rambam on page 5, 
he goes a step further. And he says that a person who is involved with others, a person who is leading others, it's just like he was learning Torah. He explains the Mesha Chochma. The Mesha Chochma, the Mayor Simcha of Davinsk, he writes, when we're talking about Noah and we're talking about Moshe Rabbeinu. And he writes, line 13 in the middle, he's quoting the Midrash, Amar Ebrachia Chaviv Moshe Minoach. Moshe was more beloved than Noach. Noach Noach started out being defined as a tzaddik and ultimately became a man of the earth. Moshe Moshe started out being called an Egyptian, became the man of God. Why? There are two paths you can take to serve God. One who completely focuses on God. One who makes the determination that he's going to separate himself from everyone. He's going to be alone with God. The other is the person who is completely involved with other people. If those are the two paths of life, you might think that the person who's only going to be with God is going to keep on going up, and the person who is going to be involved with others is only going to go down as a religious person. But what was Noach? Noach separated himself from the world. Noach separated himself. He didn't rebuke everyone else. And we say, the Chazal say he should have been destroyed. And in fact, he was doing it for himself. Ultimately, the person who only looked after himself went down from being the Tzaddik to the Isha Damam. Three, but writes the Meshachachma. Moshe was the Egyptian, who had to go out into exile. Killed because he killed that Egyptian. He was called ultimately a man of God. He got to the highest of levels. In other words, based on these precedents, we see that some of the greatest personalities in our Torah were personalities who gave up something in order to help others. That ultimately, it's about helping others. We're not sure why should it tell us a story about the Kleisenberger Rebbe, that after the war in the TP camps, when they were be able to start learning Torah again, they were able to start keeping mitzvot again, he had a small group of Talmidim who came around him and they wanted to learn with him. And the first thing he told them was, go help others. You'll have time later to be doing the learning. First, you have to take care of the Tzorchei Tzibur. It can't stand for most people on just one pillar. It can't be just on Torah for most people. We'll see a little bit more about that later. It needs that Sorchei Tzibur, that Gmilut Chasadim, is one of the ways that this world continues to exist. Rav Yitzchak Putner was the great Rosh Yeshiva of Yeshivat Rav Chaim Berlin. Earlier in his life, he was also a Talmud of Rav Kook. And he received a letter from a student of his. It begins on the bottom of page five and continues on page six. And in that letter, his student was very troubled. And he wrote that he's bothered by the fact that now that he's back, and now that he has to be involved, and now that he has to be working, he's afraid that he's leading a double life. As Rav Hutner, as he wrote to Rav, as Rav Hutner wrote to him, starting on line three on page six, Haroshem Aklali Amit Kabel Midvarechu. Rav Hutner says, "What I seem to be getting out of what you wrote to me 
כי זוהי הנחה פשוטה אצלך, כי סקולר לייף היא דאבל לייף. That living in the world, a secular life is a double life. You have a life of Torah on one side, and you have a life of secular living. You have your business life, you have your Torah life. They're separate. למותר להגיד לך כי בעולם לא הייתי מסכים בשום לאופן דאבל לייף. I would never agree, says Rav Hutner, that to a double life. אמנם מי ששוכר לו חדר בבית לחיות בו חיי תושב, הוא שוכר לו עוד חדר במלון לחיות בו חיי אורח, But if a person would have two rooms to live in, one room in a house, one room in a hotel, one room where he's going to be living, one room where he's going to feel like a guest, then obviously that is a double life. But broad life, not a double life. But Rav Hutner writes, it is possible. And Rav Hutner, by the way, in his time, he wanted to open up a college. There's a famous story. That, that the yeshiva of Chaim Berlin was going to have a college associated with it. At the end, Rav Aaron Cutler told them not to do so. But Rav Hudnerin was believed in being involved in the world. And he believed that it's possible to have two rooms in one house. A room where you're involved in the, in the world and a room where you're involved with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You're in the same house. It's not a bifurcated life. It's a synthesized life. It's a life where you can make a difference. It's a life where ultimately you can grow Bavodat Hashem and your Torah and your service and in your Gemilut Chassadim all together. And he tells the story of the famed Dr. Wallach. Dr. Wallach was the famous head early in the 20th century of Sharet Tzedek Hospital. And the story he tells, and there are many, many stories about Dr. Wallach. One of the great stories he tells about him is that he came once, and if you look on line eight, he saw someone who was sick, about to go to surgery. And he asked the patient, what's your mother's name? So that Dr. Wallach would be able to daven for him. And Rav Hutner says, when I told this to one of the G'dolei Yerushalayim, he expressed, How jealous I am of this great Jew, Dr. Wallach. He has the opportunity, such a great opportunity, to have the opportunity to have the opportunity to be one of the utensils to bring honor to, to heaven. Agidan Ali Ahmed, or Avi Chavivi said, Rav Hutner to his student, my beloved student, Ima Mirat Perek Tilim Nishlomo Shel Chole Aridei Rofe Omed Lasot Et Anituach, Aim Zeh, who double life? Are you going to say that the surgeon who then was also going to be saying Tehillim? That's a double life? He's a surgeon, that's secular. It's one life, two rooms in one home. Kol Chayecha Tzrichim, Ultimately, our entire life has to be like we say the word achad at the end of the Shema, the first pasuk of Shema, it's a long achad. There's a lot to be one in life. There's an idea and there's a way to be able to do each one of those different pillars that they strengthen the others. Rav Lichtenstein has a, an, another piece about this double business bound. And in it, what Rav Lichtenstein talks about is how is it possible to do such a thing? How is it possible to be able to live those two parts of our lives, Torah, Gmilut Chasadim, Torah, Avodah, Gmilut Chasadim, to be in the, in the world around us and in the For a world all at the same time. And he writes on the uh, on page eight, he writes a he actually records, there's a lot here. He gives a modern day example. It isn't so modern anymore. It's an example of Rav Avram Eliyahu Kaplan. Rav Avram Eliyahu Kaplan was born in 1890. He died in 1924. So he died, he was only 34 years old. But he was the Rosh Yeshiva of the Hildesheimer Seminarium in Berlin. He was the Rosh Yeshiva of the great Yeshiva of Berlin. 
And what happened was he saw in the world around him that there weren't teachers. People didn't know how to teach. And so he took time and he began to get involved in teacher training. And yet when that happened, he wrote a letter and the letter he wrote is preserved in a safer that we have that's been reprinted many times. And he writes that ultimately, line 36, He says, tragically, because of all of the other things I need to do, I don't have the ability to do the great thing that's known as learning Torah in its depth. That ultimately, the, the journey I once wanted to do is very poetic. On the waves of the sea of the Gemara and all of it, it's You have to be great to be able to give up that Torah that you once thought you could have. He looked back and Rav Lichtenstein himself writes at the bottom on line 48, looking retrospectively upon my own. Rav Lichtenstein looks back at his own life and he sees, I note more clearly and more fully that when I heard the message articulated, the power and the consistency with which it was born upon me, that ultimately Rav Lichtenstein was a Talmud. He was a Talmud of the Rav, his father-in-law. He was a Talmud of Rav Aaron Soloveitchik, the Rav's brother, he was a Talmud of Rav Hutner. <laughs> and ultimately, they differed on a range of issues regarding style, substance, priority in areas of halacha, hashkafa and public policy, although fundamentally less than many imagined. With respect to our issue, however, the double life, there was much, there was much substantive assent concerning both the perception of the problem and direction of its resolution. In other words, Rav Lichtenstein says, that even these three gedolim, they had many things they had in common, many things they differed on, but the world was together for them. There is a fascinating tshuva from Reb Moshe Feinstein on page nine. The tshuva came up with the question of a person who's learning full-time Torah. Does he have an obligation at all to teach others? Or can he be keeping himself sequestered in the Beit Midrash, just taking care of himself? And Reb Moshe says, you can be Kulo Torah, but I still say you have to give 10% of your time to teach others. Where Reb Moshe came from this, Reb Moshe came up with this idea of from 10% of giving Maser of Tzedakah. Just like we have to give 10% of our wealth, he said we have to give 10% of our learning. And the point is that even those who say you should be totally in Torah, Beginning of this year, I talked about those in the Haredi world who are staying in the yeshivot and not participating in the army in Israel. Even they aren't, by and large, kulo Torah. There are some yechidei skula, some few people, but there are always these balancing act of trying to find what and how it can be done. How do you choose? The Nitziv on page 10 talks about it. He quotes a pasuk from Mishleim. That ultimately a person goes after their heart. He said, everybody is different. You have to do what your passion is. What does your heart tell you to do? Some people will be focusing primarily on the pillar of Torah. Some will focus primarily on the pillar of Avodah. Some will focus primarily on the pillar of Gemilut Chassadim. Ultimately, you have to go ahead and go with what your passion is. Or on line 13, that ultimately, follow your heart what is the best way to learn. Follow your heart what is the best way to serve. Follow your heart what is the best way to do Torah. And Rev Lichtenstein again writes, he says that ultimately, his goal, if you want to regard this issue from a purely personal perspective, whereby the spiritual interest of the individual alone 
is to be our guide, then I suppose that our intuitive response, at least my own, is towards the Renaissance ideal. Rav Lichtenstein's own personal position was whereby a person is not limited to working in one particular area, but as a complete Oved Hashem in all your ways know him. That it's not one or the other or the other. It's trying to do all three to the best of our abilities. And that's what Rabbi Lamb spoke about once in a Chagas, at, I'm sorry, at the 100th anniversary of Yeshiva University in a famous speech that is known as Caves and Enclaves. And he said, he described ultimately the issue of Rav Shimon Bar Yochai. Rav Lichtenstein in the piece which we already learned had talked about Rav Shimon Bar, Bar Yochai. Rav Shimon Bar Yochai and his son were two people who had gone, had run away, 12 years lived in a cave, came out. And when they came out of the cave, the Gemara says they looked at people who were working, they couldn't believe them, and they people were dying because of their actions. They just couldn't believe it. They were at such a level, personal level, they had to go back for another year. That's the cave. There are some people who, the cave is the right place for them. But that's a small percentage of the Jewish people. Rather, on the other hand, the norm of Jewish society, as, as Rabbi Lamb writes on line 41 in community, or for that matter, for Talmidei Chachamim, any attempt to impose the discipline of the cave on the real world is destructive, and those who advocate it are told, go back to your cave. Just like Rabbi Shimbar Yochai ultimately had to go back into that cave, so too there are some who try to impose that segregation of just doing one that's not the norm. That's not the way we can work. And the reason I chose these topics and these mikorot for you is because, to me, they're what this Mosheva is all about. Because if you think about it, what you've done is you've taken four weeks, two weeks, six weeks of your life, and you've done it not for the money. I know the money is there, but it's not for the money. There are things you could have earned a lot more. You did it because you wanted to help somebody else. You wanted to take away from what could have been something maybe more meaningful personally, but for Tzorchei Tzibor. And that's what this Mosheva has always been about. And that's what our son, Yaakov, was all about. And normally I share with you something about Yaakov, whether it's a letter we had received or something else. This year, I shared with you a much longer piece that I'm just going to turn, ask you to turn to page 14. Seven years ago, I delivered a drashan Yom Kippur that was a letter to Yaakov. It was his 15th, it was the 15th year since he had been killed in the accident in, in Watoma. And in that, I told one story. It's on line 16. You can read it for yourself. It's in the bold print. But the story was very simple. Yaakov was an extraordinary young man. He was, when he was killed, he was 20 years old. He had learned at Yeshivat Haratzion for two years. He had done so many things. And when he was ready to come back from Israel, it was time to go to college. And so he was accepted to the University of Chicago. He was accepted to Yeshiva University. He was accepted to Northwestern. And he chose instead that he wanted to go to the Hebrew Theological College. The Hebrew Theological College is a good school, but it's not Northwestern, the University of Chicago, and it doesn't have the Yeshiva and the College of Yeshiva University. And I remember those arguments I had with him about that. But Yaakov told me the reason he wanted to do it it's because he wanted to be a matriv. He wanted to work with his chanichi. He wanted to make a difference. Those of you who are that age, you know at that point, you don't have, your parents don't have that many, those many, that many choices left either. But the reality is Yaakov made the right choice. Just like all of the other questions we've been looking at, he chose something of gemilut chasadim, of working with the tzorchei tzibur. He may not, had he lived, had he finished, I don't know what he would be doing, but I'm sure of one thing. He'd be helping others, because that's the way he started his life. And so in this sheur, I hope you gained a little bit of an insight 
of where we come from, where Mosheva comes from, where B'nai Akiva comes from. When we talk about Taravi Avodah, it's a little bit of a different Taravi Avodah than in this statement that we started with, but it's a Torah and it is involved with the Avodah is working for and with others. It is the kind of thing where you can live a life of great meaning. Maybe you yourself won't rise to the heights of what you yourself could do if you were only looking out for yourself but you'll rise to even greater heights. As the Rambam says, it's like you're learning Torah itself. The more you help your chanichim, the more you reach out to them after the summer is over and write them a note or an email or something, you can change their lives. You will change their lives. And if you think back to your years when you were a chanich, whether it was in this Moshev or any other, and you think about those madrachim who touched your lives. They did it because they saw this was the way to bring a Kadosh Baruch Hu into the world. So you have an extraordinary responsibility. The example that Yaakov set for us was something we will never forget. This Beit Knesset that we're sitting in right now is Beit Yaakov Levi. It's named for him. It was built the year for his first yard site was when this room was dead, when this space was dedicated to his memory. It was a place where he grew up in. He was here almost every year of his life. And we remember him and we thank Moshiva for letting us remember. But the way we remember him is it's not on one and it's not on two, but it's on three. And if we can live, as Rav Lichtenstein said, the Renaissance life of all three, that might be the sturdiest, the most stable, and the most normative kind of life where we can reach HaKadosh Baruch Hu and greatness that we never would have imagined. So thank you all for listening. Thank you all who came online for this. And may Yaakov's memory continue to be for a blessing, not just for us, but for this Moshevah as well.